Did you know that YouTube actually started as a video dating site with TuneIn Hookup as its unofficial slogan? Or that Twitter actually began as Odeo, a podcasting platform? However, Apple iTunes launched at the same time, making it obsolete right at the start. Of course, this concept did not take off. The founders pivoted and the rest is history. Pivots are an integral part of the startup journey. Maybe one tiny feature works much better than the whole rest of your products, or the market did not respond to your products the way you were expecting. The reasons to pivot your startups can be many. It's more a norm than an exception in early stage businesses. Hi, I'm Alice Pasomi, and I'm here with Zachary Wong, co-founder and CEO of Neuron Mobility, a leading e-scooter and micro-mobility company operating across Australia, New Zealand, the UK, Canada, and South Korea. Neuron is a vertically integrated micro-mobility tech company. So on the technology side, we build an entire technology stack from the hardware to the software to the IoT service for e-scooters, e-bikes. And on the service stack, we are operator as well. So we operate service operations in more than 25 cities around the world. And uh, we started here in Singapore in 2016. And uh, so for the past five plus years, it was a roller coaster ride for us. We started in Singapore, we entered Thailand and Malaysia, and eventually pivoted out of Southeast Asian markets where we operate now mainly in Australia, New Zealand, UK, Canada, and South Korea. So let's focus on that, right? The, the pivot. Um, so can you tell us about the early days at Neuron and especially what was the in initial assumptions around the markets in Southeast Asia and Singapore, the consumer here? So, so when we started early in 2016, we we're pretty much in uncharted water. Mm -hmm. The micro mobility industry didn't really exist. So it's a lot of test and learn, right? So I was a mechanical engineer and Harry, my co-founder was a data scientist. Mm -hmm. So for the two of us, we have a simple vision. We believe that the mobility transport system that we have in cities today is not going to work for tomorrow, right? And, uh, and we basically came in and say, how do we combine engineering innovation and data science together to create the future of a more efficient transport system? And that's really where we started. And we pretty much spending time on developing technology, thinking about technology, and uh, until our service hit the street in the middle of 2017. Mm -hmm. That's really where we brought back to earth, right? That's where we realized, um, wow, creating a future of urban transportation is not like painting a blank sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. right? So that's really where we start uh, to figure out many of the things we learned later on. And so the next few years become a very humbling sort of learning journey for us. We started off in Singapore and we were running our operations. There was a lot of tests and learn on how product sort of will work for the users and what's the right value proposition, what's the right pricing. And finally, when things start to work, we had some regulatory challenges as mm -hmm. many, of, uh, many of us here in Singapore knows that uh, that's eventually because of the private ownership of massive number of personal mobility devices and the massive bike share program early on, I think eventually the PMDs sort of uh, was out of the market, right? And uh, we had sort of pivot a little bit away from Singapore. And, uh, and then we were in Thailand, we were in Malaysia, we were basically, these are the neighbors, and mm -hmm. we were trying to figure out how do we expand our service there. And then, yes, I mean, essentially it was much more learnings than success that we had up until mid-2019 that we eventually sort of uh, pivoted into Australia and became the neuron that we know today. And, and during that, you know, kind of first uh, two to three years, right, from when you started in Singapore, mid-2017 to when you actually launched in Australia, were there times where you kind of second-guessed the idea, where you were about to just completely change and go into a brand new direction? How, how did you feel about testing the, the, that market, trying in, in, in Southeast Asia, then pulling back? I think starting the business in Singapore is all about how do you find the product market fit, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and we, we somehow felt we actually found product market fit here. Uh, the service was popular, people were using it, it was the right unit economics, things was working. And, uh, and like many other Singapore-based startups, the next thing you think about is, What's next? Where should I go? And, um, and, and then we got to Southeast Asia, like many other of the startups here. But uh, that's really where we started learning. 
all right, you had a product market fit, but now the product is the same, but your market is completely different, right? It was a very interesting but humbling experience for us. Well, we just assumed the market is going to work. So after launching our service in a couple of cities in Thailand and in Malaysia, and we spent really a lot of time there, right? And, uh, and after a while, we sort of concluded, all right, there's probably a problem with product market fit. But the big question is, what should you do, right? There's always the two parts to it. You can either say, maybe I pivot my product to suit the market, or maybe I pivot my market to suit the product, right? And, um, and it, was, it, it sounds simple, but it was a really hard one. Because <laughs> on one, it was a big dilemma for us there, right? So on one hand, we have invested a lot of effort into setting up the business in South Asia, building up the team there. We invested a lot of time personally to be in the market. So it felt like, ah, oh, I've, I've known the market so much. I've spent so much time here. Maybe I should pivot my product. But on the other hand, you felt like, ah, oh, we have invested so much in R&D. We have invested so much in technology. You create a fantastic product that we believe is great, but sure, but this, this market doesn't need it, right? So should I find a market that actually needs it? So, so you, you, it was a tough one, right? But back to your question around whether we second guess the idea and think, should we change to something completely differently? I guess it really goes back to the fundamental belief, right? So, so for us, we had a fundamental belief that we still, we were asking ourselves, but we are still believing in. So the fundamental belief is the mobility system today in cities is not going to work in the future. There is a gap here that needs to be solved. It's a matter of how do you get there and what's the sequence of that, right? So, so we hold on to that fundamental belief and figure out, and, and to be honest, there was a big stroke of luck there. We, we actually didn't know whether we shall pivot product or pivot markets, right? You know what? We are trying to do both. And, uh, and of course, doing both is the hardest thing to do and you crash in life every second day. But, um, but, but at some point, you start to see one signal start to be really strong, right? So, and on that, we got really lucky. So, so we got into the Australian market and it was a highly regulated market, but both with the technology investment we made and also with the stroke of luck, we sort of won one of the first permits out of Australia, right? The moment that happens, we the answers was made for us. We saw instant product market fit. We saw that people were loving the service, people were using the service, people were paying for the service, the infrastructure was right for the service. And that's on that day, you see, oh my God, that is how product market fit looks like. <laughs> and, sure, and, and, and the rest is history, right? Then, then the decision became clear, probably, um, probably there is a playbook for us that we can figure out there is the right market for this product and let's see how do we grow from there. I think that's sort of the a bit of the journey that we had there. And you had raised funds before the, the pivot, right? So how did you get your team but also your investors to buy into the pivot and to kind of let you experiment these first few cities in Australia? So to the team, it was quite funny um, because there was a period of time that we were thinking, ah, maybe it's the market is wrong or maybe the product is wrong, right? So, 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 so when, and we don't have a consistent message because I don't know, right? Both could work or neither of them maybe would work as well. So, so it was a very confusing time for the company, right? So, so I guess at the end of the day, we had, first thing is we had a trust from the team. <laughs> the team was like, okay, we are all in this together. Nobody really knows what's going to work and let's try as hard as we can, right? And see, see where we land. I think there's a very strong resilience that we saw in the team there. They just, they just stick on and just try different things they can. People were burning a lot of hours because they're trying to do both, right? And, uh, and um, I think on that front, we got really good team that we were running. And uh, on the other hand, I think when it comes to investors, um, it's also trust that I would say, right? And uh, from our own journey, I think we have been very fortunate to have a team of really good investors. Mm -hmm. And for good investors, what I learned was they are essentially betting on the team, right? And um, things are so uncertain. So, so we need to trust that they're betting on the team, that the team is trying to do the best they can for the business and for the company. And sure, fortunately, we had that trust. And um, so the investors was very supportive. And sure, you guys, we trust in you guys, you go figure out how it works. So I'm, I'm glad that eventually it worked out. And so once you had decided to kind of switch gears and, and go, you know, target Australia and New Zealand, 
How did you execute? Did you just uh, shut down the entire business in, in, in other Southeast Asian markets? Um, you are still have people in Singapore, though you're not operating in Singapore. So how does this decisions yeah. work? Well, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very painful process thinking back, but uh, it was also absolutely just necessary, right? So, so when we decided we're going to focus a lot on the, on the more matured market, um, I guess the first question coming to any company is, how should I deal with legacies? And what should I deal with the current markets we have? There's always a lot of inertia. There's always a lot of resistance as well. You're like, ah, oh, we have invested so much. We have, uh, we have built a team there. And, uh, and nobody likes those kind of changes, right? But, um, but we have to ask ourselves the reality that we see in both neuron and also I think generally for earlier stage startup is resource is finite, especially when it comes to the time and the bandwidth of the team, right? And uh, it's really hard to try to manage 10 things at the same time. So to us, it was a matter of, we made a decision, we want to do it and we have to do it quick, right? So, so with that, it comes with pausing our service operations, we have to scale back the team. We are trying to save as many jobs as we can save, right? But but because we are not operating anymore, some of the jobs become redundant in that sense. And, uh, and we had to painfully decide uh, to write off some of the assets. Mm -hmm. And all these are really painful process. But looking back, we could have said those investments are somehow already made. They just stick to it. They just keep on running for a little bit. But, um, but I really would not advise that. I mean, looking back, we benefited a lot from the fact that we just, in a way, cut some losses and just move on and focus on, on a new direction. Yeah. Yeah. Would you have any quick advice for founders who kind of feel stuck in that pre-pivot kind of situation, and especially if runway or lack of runway becomes an issue, right? Because that's when you can even more feel stuck. Strong opinion, weekly health, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and this is a tricky one. And, uh, and, and for us, especially operating in this uncharted terrain, I think it's, it's really a matter of you need to have something you believe in, right? Going back to your earlier question, should we have just gone completely to a new idea? I think there are some fundamental beliefs that you need to believe in, but, uh, but that's where the Strong Opinion Weekly Health comes in. Fundraising journey is painful, right? And, uh, and sometimes you need the resilience part of the, of the founders and of the team of saying, ah, oh, I just met this investor, he didn't get it. Or maybe it's his problem, right? Maybe he just didn't understand. And sometimes you need to believe that the fundraising was a matchmaking process. So you just need to find the right investor who is that, that, that appreciate and understands your idea that you need to believe in it. But some other days you need to always be self-reflective and self-aware as well and thinking, ah, <laughs> Could it be me, <laughs> right? Maybe there's something I didn't think about, and so maybe it's, it's, it's my idea that was wrong, right? So, so that's really where I think just being logical, just being objective, and sure, and just just trying to figure out what can we learn from these processes. I think is really important. Um, we obviously had a strong opinion, and obviously when the evidence shows us that we are wrong, we are just wrong, right? And so I think that's the first one. The second one is really around the fact that. I guess to many, many of founders, including ourselves, um, we are very passionate and uh, we felt like we can work 22 hours a day, right? And, and with that, you just want to take on things and you want to keep the option value, right? Because you know what, some might not work. So I want to do as many things as possible and maybe something will work, right? And, um, but, but soon we realize that to startups, it's not about how many you can work on, it's really about which other things you probably shouldn't work on, right? And, uh, and sometimes to decide to work on something is far easier than to decide on not work working on something because you lose that option value of the things that are deciding not to work. But essentially, I think you can't bet on the whole basket, right? You have to make your bet, you have to have your belief, and you have to make the decision that this is the fight not worthwhile fighting today, right? And uh, I want to focus on that instead. I think that's really important, but it's really hard. We just want to keep all the options open. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all of that. Uh, really, really super, super interesting. And I, I understand it's been a, a painful journey, but a su successful one eventually. Thank you. So Thank you. thanks for sharing all of that. Thanks a lot for watching. Uh, please hit um, the subscribe button. You will receive uh, weekly videos that we put up online. Thanks. Thanks again, Zach. Thanks, Alice.